views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at Dr. Woody Cashman, neurosurgeon in Fort Wayne, Indiana, for 41 years. But I'm only 39 years old. No, but all kidding aside, uh, I'm a neurosurgeon by profession and a doctor of wellness, frankly, uh, by passion. Tonight's show is going to be very interesting because I have with me uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Donald Reed, head of the trauma section of Lufen Hospital for over three years very experienced uh, individual. He was in the military running trauma uh, service uh, for the uh, U.S. Army, and now he's running it uh, for Lufen Hospital, and has tremendous experience. And of course, I've had 41 years uh, experience uh, with uh, brain and uh, spinal trauma. And tonight's discussion, I think you will find uh, very interesting. We will discuss the illnesses, uh, diseases, and also talk a lot about prevention. But first, uh, Dr. Reed, tell me a little bit uh, about the trauma, sort of an overview uh, of the areas that you treat, the facilities that you have available, a little bit about your experience, and then we'll go over the uh, individual uh, injuries uh, that we've seen over, over the years. I'm really looking forward to this discussion with you. Well, thanks, Dr. Cashman. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in general, we cover northeastern Indiana, extends uh, quite far south. We have the uh, Lutheran Health Network Hospitals, and a group of other hospitals extending north, actually north of the state line, and uh, approximately halfway to Indianapolis. So we get patients from a long distance. Uh, they're brought in often by helicopter, but also by ground, both here locally in Allen County and in the surrounding counties. Um, we have a variety of facilities available to us, and at Lutheran we have both the adult as well as the pediatric trauma center. Very... Uh large area that we cover here at uh, uh, Lutheran Hospital and uh, you've really, uh, I must uh, truly admit, uh, Dr. Reed, I don't want to embarrass you, but I have been highly impressed uh, with your ability. It's really been great working uh, with you. Tell me a little bit about uh, one of the most common things, of course, that we see every day, uh, every weekend, uh, car accidents, truck accidents, three-wheelers, four-wheelers, uh, bicycles, uh, motorcycles. Uh, tell us uh, somewhat about that uh, uh, experience? Well, it's unfortunate, but uh, the number one cause of deaths in the adult population um, below, I think it's up to age 40, is traumatic injury in this country. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, there's a lot of talk about uh, how do we uh, catch cancer early, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. But for certainly um, children, youth, young adults, and even up to uh, young middle-aged adults, injury prevention would, would save far more lives than any efforts in other, in other endeavors. The uh, incidence of uh, fatal um, highway accidents, highway fatalities, is actually, I'm happy to report, on the decline. Mm -hmm. And that's a, um, that's a, there's a spirit of debate going on in this country now about the cause for that decline. Part of it is seatbelt use, which of mm -hmm. course I'm happy mm -hmm. to report is mandatory now in the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, has led to, uh, we believe, uh, an improved um, um, uh, or higher rate of usage among adult drivers. And um, I was uh, at the uh, cer ceremony when the uh, state police uh, opened their click it or ticket program here in Fort Wayne. We had the state opening there. And I share the uh, state police passion 
for making sure drivers are belted, as you well know from your experience. Yeah, I've seen the decline in uh, children injuries because uh, parents are obeying the law and putting the kids in the back seat and, and belting them in. It's been a tremendous reduction in, in trauma in children. I'm very happy to report. Correct. And uh, back seats especially. Uh, yeah. Improved compliance with keeping children in, in the rear seat. That seems to be a much safer mm -hmm. location. Now we still do see fatal injuries from back seat passengers, but they seem to be at a far lower frequency mm -hmm. or incidence than front seat passengers. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, uh, absolutely. And I've seen though still which concerns me a great deal, and I don't think the public is generally aware, that motorcycles, three-wheelers, and four-wheelers are extremely dangerous. People go up and down these hills and pass these trees, which are not mobile. I mean, you run into a tree, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be in intensive care. I don't know if people realize the risks they're taking uh, with uh, motorcycles, three-wheelers, four-wheelers. They concentrate on the helmets, but that's only a small part of the prevention problem. A big thing. Uh, wearing a helmet is great, great value, but, but there's still uh, the acceleration, the deacceleration, the torsion forces. I mean, this brain of ours is a three-pound piece of fat. I mean, it's nothing. It's so easy to injure it cool. and uh, end up uh, living in a nursing home. Uh, we see it, you know, you and I see it uh, every uh, uh, weekend, uh, and uh, people have to be they really think twice before these three-wheelers and four-wheelers because uh, uh, we see a lot of deaths a lot of paralysis, a lot of people living in nursing homes and their lives ruined in a second. Like that, your life changes uh, from an injury. It isn't a long-term illness with cancer. You, you might take years for you to die, but in trauma, your life changes like that. I think very important thing uh, uh, to remember. Uh, Dr. Reed, tell us a little bit about what percent of trauma do you think, uh, besides maybe a bad habit to go riding around with something without a helmet on, but just from bad habits, say, of alcohol, cigarettes, uh, texting, arguing, uh, is that a significant uh, percentage of the injuries? Um, unfortunately, Dr. Cashman, it's a high, it's a high incidence. Um, the, um, the, with driving a motor vehicle, for instance, even if you're uh, belted in correctly and you've got a relatively new vehicle and you're mm -hmm. equipped with airbags, which I think has contributed substantially to a uh, decrease in traffic fatalities, if you're a distracted driver, and distraction can run anywhere from being inebriated or under the influence of prescription drugs. In fact, um, mm -hmm. I see a big problem in this community particularly in, in northeastern Indiana in general, in Allen County and Fort Wayne in particular, with pa uh, patients driving uh, under the influence of prescription narcotics and not realizing that that affects their judgment, that affects reaction time. Uh, it has basically the same effect as a drink of alcohol, which they may not consider doing and go and climb behind the wheel, but they'll happily take their prescription narcotics. When I pres prescribe narcotics, I always write on there, do not drive on this medication. Yet I frequently find either physicians aren't telling their patients this or the patients are simply ignoring the advice. I think that's a huge comment uh, because I, I see this also. You know, they want to put everybody in jail for a little bit for alcohol, which certainly is appropriate, but uh, much more of a problem with multiple use of medications. I see people in the 80s on 15 medications. Correct. Well, what do you think they're going to do when they get behind a wheel? Right. Uh, and you have to be very careful to tell your relatives or yourself not to drive when, when you are under the influence uh, of medication. Personally, right. you know, we have these laws on, on alcohol, but let's face it, you got one glass of wine and you hit the road. Is your judgment going to be different? You may not be above the legal limit, but I tell you, your judgment is going to be different. Because I know I go to a restaurant for a hard day and have a glass of wine. I know what it does to me. And you're going to get behind a wheel. Uh, I say, if you're going to drive, don't drink at all. Right. I say, even if the law allows a little bit of it, don't. If you had a drink, do not drive. Because you can kill your family, uh, kill somebody else, and it can happen just like that. The same with medication. You're, you're taking some of your medications and the mixture of them, and you're going to drive down the road. Uh, we saw it recently, uh, even at the hospital. Someone uh, had taken uh, insulin in inappropriately, and they almost destroyed the neighborhood. Correct. And, uh, and med medication can change things uh, like that. Wait. And, and texting, you know, is a, a big uh, thing now. Right. And, uh, One anecdote on the on the prescription medication yeah. recently. 
uh, well, it wasn't recently, probably in the past year, I saw a lady who was working, and yeah. she was driving a vehicle, and under the influence of prescription yeah. narcotics, she got in an accident, and her husband came in, and I was discussing this with him. Fortunately, she wasn't severely injured. injured. She had injured yeah. uh, another driver, but also not seriously. And I told her, you know, you realize you can't, you can't drive on this medication. She said, yeah. well, my doctor never told me. And I said, it's incredibly important. It can lead to changes in, in your behavior, your, your driving abilities. And she said, to her, looked at her husband and said, can you believe that? That's the same thing the ER doctor told me after my last accident. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, this uh, occurs not uh, uncommonly. And this is, I'm glad you brought this up because this is not emphasized enough about the effects of uh, medication. I had a texting thing and was killed me the other day. I walked out of a place getting a cup of coffee, uh, and I looked left, saw nobody, looked right, saw nobody, and kept on going. And, and ahead of me comes a teenager texting away, uh, looking uh, uh, down, uh, texting, and she was trying to get in line in this fast food restaurant. Almost killed me. If I hadn't looked up once more, uh, I would have been gone. And this is extremely uh, uh, prevalent. I mean, cell phones can do the same thing. You go dialing the number, uh, and uh, you can, uh, uh, any more of it, I'm on call as a physician. Uh, I've made it a habit now, and the calls are important to the emergency room or whatever. I pull over and make my phone calls because even a slight distraction, you know, your, your car is swerving off the road, and, and I caution people uh, to uh, pay close attention to that. And verbal distractions, I found, can make a difference. You know, family argument or... I remember coming home from Florida, four kids in the back seat. Uh, they're having a little bit of verbal discussion, and I lean back to, uh, you know, correct. let them have it a little bit to correct to correct them. And you know, here I am driving on a major highway. Yeah, those things you gotta wa gotta watch those uh, things. Does uh, a weather affect a trauma? Like here we are uh, in the uh, emergency room uh, the other day, and it's snow and it's, and it's icy, and the stories you. Uh, and I are seeing are really, frankly, almost not believable, are they? We yeah. really have seen, been seeing it, them. It makes terrible a trauma. huge difference. Yeah. And, yeah. and it affects uh, two groups, and I think in two different ways. One uh, patient we saw from an accident being driven by an older sibling. Uh, the sibling's not even a brand new driver, been driving for several years. Adverse conditions, the car goes out of control, and an occupant of the vehicle is severely injured, basically a fatal injury. And, and it probably was simply the road conditions. It was not lack of experience on the part of the driver's um, uh, experience. And in fact, I think that's what the police concluded at the accident yeah. scene. Another case, I saw a very inexperienced driver. I don't know, are you aware that um, in, in, in uh, the history, lifetime of a driver's experience, their number one period for a chance of a fatality while driving is their first year driving, age 16. Their second highest year is age 17. And it goes down for the rest of your life until your very, very advanced yeah. years, 80s and 90s. I think some parents are not aware of it, but, but many are. And all of us are extremely nervous uh, when, you know, a teenager is starting to drive. And I think most are aware, but it, that there is a time, but you have to really have a talk with the teenagers. They have to have very strict rules. I think there was a reason for that smashed up car sitting in front of Homestead High School for a few months They're trying to remind the kids what happened to one of their fellow classmates. In every year, somebody there is severely injured, dies, or is paralyzed of their life, ruined uh, for a lifetime. I remember seeing one just uh, stood up back of a pickup truck, and the, him and the brother handled an argument, and he sped up the car, and he somersaulted off the back, and, and there's been some permanent serious impairment, although I, I saved that individual, but it still was a very uh, serious uh, uh, injury. Uh, and, 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 uh, and one we saw recently that, uh, remember it was snow day, and I think one of the school officials called up and said it's okay to come to gymnastics, and that person got in a very serious accident. Remember that? We saw Correct. That. Yeah, that was, so, we had both taken uh, care of parents, that Parents, if, if there are snow conditions and the kids can't go to school, yeah, don't allow them out of the house in a car unless you're driving it. I think it's important. I think don't it you is. Think from yeah. that experience, I got things to learn too, and we learn from that. You know what I mean? I heard when yeah. we were talking yeah. about that at work, some yeah. of the nurses were yeah. saying that some yeah. of the coaches imply that, well, we're not going to have an official school sanctioned yeah. practice, but if you don't yeah. show up, you yeah. may not play in the game yeah. this weekend yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that was a very serious matter. Let's talk a little bit about a very sad subject, but you and I see it all the time child abuse. 
uh, resulting uh, in trauma. And we have in the hospital right now some very serious cases. Right. In fact, I'm operating one tomorrow morning. Uh, and how sad it is, I've been you know, in this business 41 years at age 39, and, and uh, I've run the Crippled Children's Clinic over many years, and I've seen many of these injuries. Some are fatal, some are permanent. I've seen children permanently with tracheostomies, uh, uh, mentally impaired, uh, uh, living in a nursing home the rest of their life. Uh, so if you're going to have someone else babysit for you, and, 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 and all of us have to, you know, we, we have to make a living. I went through the same thing. Right. I was in med school. My wife's working. She's the one paying the bills. We had a babysitter. You have to do it. But, but sometimes the boyfriends are watching them, and you get, you get to know who's watching your child. Right. Uh, and uh, we've seen numerous injuries uh, from uh, babysitter injuries, but we've seen them from parents too. Right. Very, very serious, mentally impaired parents, alcoholics, uh, drug people, and they're having children. Uh, and and, uh, and, and, and when they're the drugs and medications and alcohol, um, uh, they can injure their child. Uh, and we, we see it commonly. Injuries are permanent. And, 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 uh, and some would, you know, in the end might say, geez, I don't even remember doing that because they're, you know, were drugged up. So childhood injuries we're seeing. Uh, a lot of them, in it, and I warn the parents too, I tell you, if your child has a couple of injuries, the welfare department will indeed investigate it, the, the, the services, and, uh, and you may end up without your child. And I'm telling you from experience, it's almost frightening to me. You can lose your child because of an investigation where they suspect you're part of it, like that. I see it. People who have two or three children, and those people walk in there, and your child is gone. Your children are gone. I see it. So injury prevention... Uh, it's extremely important, uh, and some of these cases are borderline, and I see people losing their children. I mean, it would devastate me. can't imagine what it does to other parents. You know, they had a cup of drinks and, and dropped their child or hit their child. Uh, you hit your child, you're in front of a policeman. So uh, I think childhood trauma uh, is, is, is something that we all want to prevent, and these stories are, are never happy. They're never happy. They're, they're complex, and, uh, and, uh, and the law does what it needs to do, and most of the time it's, it's appropriate, but it's sometimes, you know, borderline, Donald. I think you experience uh, uh, that too. Wasn't there a case recently yeah. where I thought a couple was arguing and then the child got in the way of, a, of an instrument or a, a bat or a pole was being used by one adult to strike the spouse and the child walked in front or in between them and got struck by the object? I mean, it was horrible head injury. You're absolutely right, Dr. Reed. And sad to say, I was a doctor who, who was seeing that, uh, that child, unfortunately. Now I'm going to raise a little very interesting question here. And I've always had a major in, uh, interest in it over years. I've written a lot of letters to the editor about it, frankly, going 30 years back. Uh, you may not believe this, Dr. Reed, but I spoke to Sheriff Herman and, and, Sheriff, uh, and uh, Chief of Police York how many guns do you think are in these counties, the audience watching? So give yourself a number in your mind. I, you know how many guns there are in Allen County? One million. One million guns in this county of 300,000 people. And only half the people own those. Right. So what are we seeing in the emergency room? What are we seeing in the emergency room? And I'm not even making an anti-gun statement. What I'm making is uh, just telling you how many guns there are. Uh, in, the count, in the county we're seeing. And the highest percentage of gun injuries that I've been seeing have been accidental because they're in the house. They're not locked up. The child gets into the gun. I've seen children get shot by a gun lifted at the, bed, at the yeah, bedside uh, ac because they're not properly locked up, probably taken care of. They, they have uh, bullets in them and the, and, and the gun is not uh, locked up. Or uh, mom and dad get in an argument uh, and uh, and uh, either one shoots the other. I sure as heck have, have seen that. Many uh, die. Many live in nursing homes. The number of uh, uh, unintended uh, gun injuries is, is tremendous. If you have a gun in the house, uh, 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 no question, I think there may be some people who need a gun in the house. I don't deny that. It's an anti-gun statement. But gun safety needs to be practiced. And if you have one, for Pete's sake, learn how to use it appropriately. Uh, and... and uh, uh, because uh, we're seeing, uh, uh, I, I have a number of people in wheelchairs because they've been either shot by someone or accidentally shot. We see a number of criminal acts based on guns. And, uh, and so I, what am I promoting? Gun safety. 
and right. safety. We've and, had several yeah. cases this fall that, that yeah. brought that right to the fore. Yeah. We had a, a young fellow who was carrying a loaded firearm yeah. legally, but yeah. he was drinking beer. Yeah. And he shot himself in his the lower half yeah. of his body, yeah. and he was totally perplexed and very defensive. I said, "You know, this this was this was a yeah. very poor choice on your part." And he said, "But it was legal." I said, "It didn't matter if it was legal. The point was one of one of the first rules of gun safety, and I own several of those firearms you're talking about, is you don't mix alcohol and firearms. That's that's a that's in every hunter safety course you've ever probably ever been published anywhere. Uh, second. I saw a, a, a very sad case of a, a, a hero, a Marine, with three tours of duty over overseas, Iraq and Afghanistan, who came back, got uh, too heavily um, inebriated and intoxicated, took a, took a weapon and shot himself in the head. You may have even seen that patient. He was in the intensive care unit for weeks. Now, fortunately, he survived, but his life is going to be changed yeah. forever. He's disabled. You know, living in a, in a nursing home. Correct. We uh, had another case recently yeah. where a yeah. fellow was coming home from the doctor's office or wherever he had gotten prescription yeah. narcotics, yeah. dropped his loaded firearm in the snow, and it discharged into his left chest. He's lucky to be alive. And, yeah. and the family member who was with him said, oh, but doctor, it was legal. I said, I don't care if it was legal. The point was it was stupid. Why are you carrying a loaded firearm when you're, when you're taking narcotics? Yeah, people take guns too lightly. And there are a lot of mentally impaired people out there uh, who have a gun. And the family knows they have a gun. And that's extremely dangerous because the first time uh, they get into an argument with somebody or feel threatened, uh, they, they are going to use it. Uh, and uh, uh, we see it uh, more and more. We have one million guns in this county. That's an unbelievable number. And, uh, and I, I don't have the answer to it. It's not an anti-gun statement. It's, it's safety, for Correct. one thing. Safety is what's uh, important. Safe, safety, I think, what is uh, extremely important. And the first sign of an impaired person uh, or a marri marriage problem, one need to pay, pay attention to these weapons and get them locked up. Correct. Because it's, it's dangerous. Can uh, I mention yeah. another one we had yeah. this past year? Yeah. We had an elderly fellow who was depressed upon the death yeah. of his uh, longtime spouse. Yeah. They'd been married for years or whatever. And he took a loaded firearm and tragically ended his life. Um, we were unable to save him. And, uh, and that was simply an elderly person with a perfectly legal weapon, uh, uh, entirely within his rights to own it, but he became depressed and then he used it to end his own life. And I think that the public should be aware that if you have an elder parent or a grandparent or an aunt, uncle, neighbor, or whatever, and they go through the death of a spouse, you have to very carefully consider what kind of a situation they're in. It may not, it, you may have to do more than just stop them by and ask them, you know, once a week, how are you doing, and take them out for a lunch or whatever. You may want to investigate and make sure that they don't have weapons of destruction around their house that they're going to use on themselves. I think that's an excellent comment, and I have seen it. Uh, suicides uh, are a lot more common with guns today, and I've seen it from children, teenagers, high school kids. Uh, high school time is, is a very stressful time of uh, uh, our lives. Think of back of myself, too. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to have a suicide, uh, an easy, easier way out than stabbing yourself or whatever, uh, uh, as a cause of uh, a suicide is, is not uncommon. Uh, we see it. You know, if we're on call for a weekend, we commonly see uh, uh, one gun injury per weekend. At oh least. yeah, I'm sure. In this community, in between this community, the two trauma yeah, centers, easily. Absolutely. Between yeah, and we see it more commonly as 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 the as the years go by. Mm -hmm. So, uh, since being a neurosurgeon, I treat a lot of head injuries. Let's talk about the, uh, this part specifically a little bit, and you can tell us a little bit more down the line: chest, abdominal injuries, uh, what you've seen. But let's start at the. T Top of the body, the yeah. thing that sits on top of us and regulates the, the most important thing. The most right? important <laughs> thing, our brain. That's a three pound piece of fat. It's a three pound piece of fat sitting, sitting in some skull. You see, uh, that can be very easily, you know, very easily uh, in, uh, injured. Uh, let's talk about a little bit, can, to begin with, a simple injury. You think it's simple, but uh, in the end, a concussion. Yes. You know, if you get a, uh, a, a child uh, in sports, in school, and, and they get tackled or get hit, 
actually, hockey is the most common cause of head injury. Yeah, it's not football. Yeah. Yeah, and then there'd be football, and then we got basketball, uh, uh, and then it's baseball. And it, I've seen it from golf injuries, so I've seen major head injuries from golf injuries. I have seen in my 41 years at age 39, <laughs> I've seen fatal golf injuries. Yes, because that little missile uh, can, can uh, cave your skull in, and I've seen it... Uh, uh, impair uh, children. How about this? I've seen yeah. I've seen a young a young man yeah. whose life was tragically ended by an endocrine injury who fell out of a golf cart. I've seen yeah. a couple of those where kids yeah. are just goofing around. They may be caddies. Yeah. They may be partying with their friends. They go yeah. over a curb too fast in a golf cart, fall out and walk dead. I haven't seen anybody wearing a helmet in a golf cart. Actually, golf carts, believe it or not, are quite da dangerous. My former yeah. chief of neurosurgery, Dr. Lessenhub, who taught me neurosurgery, uh, he was from Mass General uh, last year died from a golf cart injury. Okay. You know, you get a little hill, you get this thing, no safety valves, it right. can roll up real easy. Right. People should keep that in mind. But let's talk about concussions. Hey, what's a, con a concussion? Your head gets hit, the brain shakes, and the torsion forces, uh, and uh, chemical changes in the brain due to an MRI, you see nothing. But you may have a headache, you may have memory loss for the, for the event, uh, you may uh, recover uh, within a day or two, there may be uh, vomiting, but you, they're playing in the ball game. They should not enter the ball game again that day. That's correct. They, they need to be screened by a medical professional, but the question is, they never mentioned in that, what professional? Well, it, it should be a neurologist or a neurosurgeon or a trauma surgeon because uh, it, it is not always easy to predict uh, uh, what's going to happen. Many times they should be watched for a few days, uh, maybe even a week or 10 days, and see, make sure their cognitive function, their memory is working good, that the, the grades in school are about the same because there'd be subtle changes that you don't uh, know about. And if you have, say, more than th uh, three concussions, probably should pull them out of the sport right. because it, it can cause changes in the brain, uh, amyloid bodies, neurofibrillary tangles, and down the line, they have memory loss, they have dementia. Uh, now we have shown studies in football injuries. You notice the guys in 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. a lot of dementia coming up. That is amazing. A lot of dementia uh, come up. So and multiple head injuries add up because they cause these changes of amyloid bodies and neurofibrillary uh, tangles. Uh, so we, we have a concussion, generally you recover and generally you're normal, but I saw one today that had been hit by a golf ball two years ago, saw me today, having a little memory problem. Uh, uh, just today I saw the patient, wow. uh, a young boy, 15 years or 14 years old, having some memory problems in school. So I'm going to get an MRI on him and see this maybe it was a little damage there. Very hard to predict. I mean, it's, it's and not much you can do about not it. Not much. You know, say go see a professional. Well, it's got to be a professional who knows something. Yeah. That's the point. Even cognitive testing doesn't really screen them out. The next level trauma is contusion where they have a bruising, uh, and then the uh, next level where they have some real brain hemorrhages and they go to intensive care, uh, uh, sometimes intubated, major uh, head trauma. You do an MRI, a CT, you see all kind of bruises uh, everywhere. That's a major injury. Some, some live, some don't. Mm -hmm. Some end up in, uh, in a nursing home, and, and some, you know, going to die. The other thing I'm seeing more and more of, which is kind of interesting, is patients who've been on anticoagulants, blood thinners. They've been on Plavix. They've been on aspirin. They are on Coumadin. I would say this to you. Be absolutely sure that you need those medications. That's critical. I see a number of patients who've been on Coumadin for the last 10 years, and not a good reason, who've been on Plavix, which is the more dangerous of the drugs even many times, uh, for many years, uh, and that's not a good reason. I see a significant number of that, maybe a third of the patients I see shouldn't be on aspirin, Plavix, or something. Have it checked. Double check with your doctor. Do I absolutely need to be on medications? Because the reason being, a light injury, you might survive. But if you're in a blood thinner and you take, a minor, say, a minor fall, you may end up dead. You may end up with a nursing home. You may end up with a blood clot. I see that problem, Dr. Reed, and you see this problem every weekend. Yes. Every weekend do we see major head injury, especially in the elderly, where they're on, on an anticoagulant, on a blood thinner, what was a minor injury, a little fall in the bathroom where they might have survived. Now they're laying there unconscious, paralyzed, becoming more demented. Now they were living at home, driving the car, and now what is life? A nursing home. Dr. Cashman, I saw two cases today from fairly today. minor trauma today. who were on Coumadin. Now, you would have to agree. I mean, there's certainly yep. great indications for these medications. Absolutely. And the doctors who prescribe them should know these. Like, 
you yeah. know, say you have a heart arrhythmia or an artificial valve, yeah. you're in Coumadin yeah. or Plavix because yeah. the blood circulates your leg. Yeah. But I agree with you. They need to check with their physician. The biggest one I see are not the lack of indications for the medication, but I see the patients being on these medications for years. Sometimes the patients can't yeah. even remember while they're on. They had a blood clot while they're yeah. in the hospital. Yeah. What's indication? Three or six months of Coumadin? I'll see these people three years later sometimes and they're still on the Coumadin because nobody bothered to ever stop it, you know? You're absolutely right, Dr. Reed. I see this commonly, so please double check. Be sure you're on it for a darn good, solid reason because the lightest injury can turn to a major deal. And it's not just head injuries, it's also spinal injuries. Correct. You know, let's add the spinal injuries to it a little bit. How often do I see a person that's paralyzed in their legs or arms and legs? It's not that uncommonly. No. And in and, and, and a lifetime uh, in a wheelchair, it's sure a, a change of life. And, uh, and I can think of one on Highway 14 many years ago, a young man, the parents forgot to belt him in, but he was a teenager. He should have known better himself. Right. He got thrown out of the car, and he's quadriplegic now. Right. Uh, can't move his arms and legs. Fortunately, he's adjusting beautifully, but still, his life certainly would have been better, you know, uh, uh, without it. Right. And, uh, and uh, I see it from snowmobile accidents today. The snowmobile runs into it. You know, you go in the woods, you're running through the woods, past trees. Trees are, trees are solid things. They don't move. They don't move. You hit. You take a snowmobile and and you and you, uh, you hit a tree. Some serious injury is going to occur, and especially when they do this at very high speeds. Isn't it fascinating? It's very, it's I dangerous. talked to I talked yeah. to even relatives of mine yeah. from Michigan with yeah. snowmobiles. Everybody yeah. brags about how fast their machine yeah. can go, yeah. and I'm thinking, but anything you hit is going to yeah. be solid and standing still. I had a I had a tragic case of a yeah. of a female patient of mine years ago whose young husband, wonderful man, beautiful marriage, little mm -hmm. children, he's out snowmobiling in the middle of the night, can't see, crossing a farm field, hits a wire, and he's decapitated. This is a 23 or 24-year-old young man with a wife, children, and his whole life ahead of him ended tragically because he's going fast across the farm field in the dark. Yeah, th th this is uh, what, what we see. Uh, and, uh, uh, and snowmobiles especially, and they're going to pick up soon. We'll be seeing a lot more of these. If you're going at a high rate of speed, remember what I said, this is a three-pound piece of brain you got up there. It don't take a lot to change it. Right. I see it uh, in the summertime. I see it from skiing accidents, uh, any more tubing, for example. I've, mm -hmm. We've seen horrible injuries uh, of the uh, change of pressure in the pelvic area, especially of women. We s have seen their pelvic organs torn out, haven't we, Dr. Yeah. Reed? And I know of one after that became infected. Uh, what do you think uh, the life of that patient is going to be? Never going to have children. Chronic pain problem. Uh, so uh, the, the, this tubing can be very dangerous because right. of the pressure changes. You know, uh, one thing uh, you mentioned a minute ago, yeah. I wonder if we could go back to for just a second. Um, yeah. You were talking about concussions, Dr. Cashman, uh, and, and athletes, young athletes, say student athletes, high school, even middle school, mm -hmm. being sent back into the game by their, yeah. by their coach. And I think you should feel comfortable or the parents should feel empowered that they can say no to that. I mean, it's not up to the coach. It's up to the parent. And if you're on the sideline and your child is injured, I don't care if the coach says, yeah, they can go back in or not. You tell them you want your child removed from the game until they're cleared by a medical professional, just like Dr. Cashman said. Uh, I think parents should be comfortable, very comfortable about saying that to the coaches. I appreciate you saying that. It's absolutely true. And some of us sometimes, including myself, I went to a very small high school, Concordia High School, Bronxville, New York, and we had 150 students, and we had 11 tremendous football players. They needed to practice against somebody, and I was a tennis player and a basketball player, and although not, you know, yeah. fortunately, I still play tennis at this young age of 39 now, <laughs> and a lot of trophies. But Got on the football team. That was the stupidest thing you dream up. I remember my mother signing the permit. I can't, can't believe it. Uh, and it was silly. It, it could have killed me. It, it frankly uh, uh, could have killed me. Uh, I mean, the t type of trauma. The parents have to remember, this brain can't take that much. The knees and hips can't take that much. And we see significant uh, orthopedic injuries. We haven't talked much about that, of knee and hip injuries that we see from for major sports, and they have them for the lifetime. Most kids aren't going to the pros, but uh, like, well, let me give you an example. Uh, one, of my son, one of my son in laws can't beat me on tennis <laughs> because of a knee injury. Really? Yeah, he can't. He just can't do it. My, my Eventually, son. Eventually, that third set, he right. just gives out because of that, that, that uh, knee. 
my son, who is a yep. big is a big skier and runner, yep. age 23, just graduated from college and and had his fourth yep. knee operation yeah. because of all the yep. knee injuries over the years. You yep. know, it's very common. And fortunately, we have a lot of orthopedic advances. There's wonderful yep. things they yep. can do to reconstruct these and that. But none of these are as good as prevention. You're exactly correct. I mean, we have wonderful orthopedic surgeons now doing hips and knees and everything else. Uh, but but let's face it, most of, a lot of the time, it's, it's just not as good as new. Correct. They not as good as the way God made it. <laughs> you're, you're exactly right. Prevention is a very important uh, thing. And I think before you pick up a sport uh, where you take a lot of chances, and I know a lot of my friends are going skiing big time, you know, going down the hill and trees. I mean, it's, 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 it's I mean, you got to be uh, realistic. Uh, they better have the life insurance and the health insurance right. in, intact now, because uh, we, we do see very significant uh, injuries. How about not hardly commonly, but they, but they occur. Right. How about helmets with skiing? Yeah. I think yeah. that's a wonderful adjunct. Yeah. My children yeah. were raised at ages three and four skiing up in Michigan. Yeah. We all skied. Yeah. And now in their 20s, they're both wearing helmets. I yeah. think uh, one of my, my daughter, yeah. I bought her a helmet for just yeah. last month. And yeah. she's willing to wear it because of the risk of a head injury. Yeah. But, but people must remember, helmets is not the final and utter answer. Correct. The, the traumatic events, you can injure your spine. you got a helmet on, you can still right. break your neck, hit the spinal cord, and now you're quadriplegic. You can't move your arms and legs. Right. And we see uh, uh, plenty of that. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and I, I see well, there were two motorcyclists last year yeah. at Peru. As much as yeah. I preach the use yeah. of helmets on motorcyclists, these two motorcyclists were decapitated. So yeah. a helmet's not going to keep you from being decapitated. Exactly. Uh, by nature, uh, uh, motorcycles are dangerous. They're just although, dangerous. Yeah. Uh, although, certainly, uh, the, the, I see situations, man and wife riding them across the country, and it's a wonderful family thing. But by the, they better be prepared by their nature, because a lot of people on the road are on medications and drugs. Um, uh, they can't see very good uh, because of aging situations, uh, and uh, they're going to run across the motorcycle people. I, I, it's not always the fault of the motorcycle person. No. But they're in the motorcycle. That's the trouble. Right. And, 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 uh, the well, think about the weight yeah. difference between yeah. a vehicle and a motorcycle. I mean, who's going to win? That's the point. And, uh, and we see deer injuries that run out and they're hit by a motorcycle. Odds are you're not going to survive it. And we see plenty of uh, severe car accidents from deer today. So when you're driving at night or in the early in the morning when the deer are especially prone to come out, now I see them coming out in the middle of the day. And uh, to be very careful and look on the sides, I always do, especially where I live over near the Devil's Hollow. And I have a deer coming out almost every night. I go over there, but I purposely drive very slow. People are almost hitting my bumper, so I'm going too slow. But if the deer runs out, uh, uh, it's not just I'm concerned just about myself. I'm concerned about the animal, too. I mean, just to kill an animal, is that nothing? No, it's not nothing. That's just right. the way I... We had, way, an, we had an yeah. ER nurse that uh, works yeah. at Lutheran whose yeah. car was totaled by a deer about Absolute. a month ago. Absolute. You know, Absolutely. Fortunately, she they, wasn't They can injured, come but. through the windshield, you know, and, uh, and everything else. Let's talk a minute uh, about farm injuries, you know, that, that we see a significant number of farm injuries, especially uh, among the Amish, very hard-working uh, people. Uh, and we see that not uncommonly, don't we? No, oh, it's very yeah. common. In fact, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's surprisingly common for someone who's not from around here, which I'm not, yeah. to come into this. And, and as a yeah. community, the Amish are very hardworking, and they start at a very young age. But they're, uh, by nature of the very industries that they run and the farming that they, uh, that they live on, um, they have uh, exposed... Uh, a significant percentage of their children and even adults to farm-related uh, accidents. We see buggy accidents. We see horses. I had a I had a young boy following a horse who got kicked in the liver, who had a liver shattered liver. Um, we'll see head injuries from kids falling out of haylofts or second floors of garage and and um, and. Uh, uh, you just saw, you were telling me about yeah. a saw accident you saw recently. Yes, I, just the other weekend. And for, by, by fact, my weekend call last, last weekend uh, I, it was pretty tough because they had two injuries uh, in children that didn't make it. One was an Amish child walked into a sawmill and amputated his, his arm in the uh, back of his uh, brain. And uh, I mean, uh, a, a horrible situation. Uh, and uh, they, um, for a horse to injure a, a child, or, a, or anyone in the Amish community is not uncommon. We, we see that mm -hmm. uh, frequently. Uh, commonly, but you know, that's how they make their living, and it's not being critical there, but just you have to 
be uh, aware of be, the surroundings be aware and the, of the risks that are involved. Uh, this risks are involved, and, and frankly, in my experience, they can take it better than anybody. Matter of fact, you remember we saved this child with a frontal trauma. Mm -hmm. Remember this child that we, that we saved, and in a, in a, in a, let's have a little fun here. A hundred Amish invited myself and my nurse and you to come to their farm for a celebration uh, of his life, and we went. <laughs> <laughs> and they put me in the middle of a circle surrounded by the Amish, and we discussed philosophy for a half hour. Yeah. It was one of the most Wasn't beautiful little, moments. Little boy, you got the that hat boy, to cover yeah, yeah. his uh, it was, head it was injury. In Napanee, Napanee. Yeah, yeah. And the lady, you know, I, I, I sell books and write books. I've written 10 books. And, uh, and, uh, and the lady had a little bookstore called The Little Nook in Napanee. So I really enjoyed walking through that, <laughs> which was as good a bookstore as I see anybody privately <laughs> owned. And we had a wonderful celebration of, of a life. So I, I frankly love the Amish people and their uh, uh, injuries. But we have to, you know, we drive near a buggy. We got to be careful. I see a number of cars hitting buggies. And uh, that's the way of life. We need to respect that. Right. We need to respect uh, that as drivers. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they're going slow. You're yeah. the one who needs to be careful, not them. Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, let's talk a little bit about sports. It, the major sports injuries that, that we've seen uh, over the years. Tell me a little bit about the orthopedic injuries you've seen. I, that if they don't have a head injury, I wouldn't see them. Right. But uh, can you tell us about chest injuries, belly injuries, uh, 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 knee injuries, hip injuries? Well, the common ones, Dr. Cashman, of course, are extremity injuries. Everybody sees the broken wing, yeah. the arm, the yeah. collarbone, and the knees yeah. we've been discussing, like in our own families. Um, but less common ones. I had a young fellow last uh, year who was uh, stepped on by a lineman. He was a nice boy, but honestly, he was kind of what you'd decide, define as a scrawny kid out on a football field. Mm -hmm. And a much bigger lineman crossed him and stepped on his abdomen with a cleat and ruptured his spleen. Um, it was uh, tough to make a diagnosis. Fortunately, he kept having pain. The parents brought him to the hospital, and he got evaluated. But it's not like the coach or even an a athletic trainer can diagnose an, a ruptured internal organ at the side of the... Everybody gets excited because these, these trainers run out on the field and try to help the athletes. Well, they're not going to diagnose internal injuries any more than they can diagnose a head bleed. If you hadn't made the diagnosis, he could have died. Absolutely. It could have and it could have been. Right. Could have been they needed to bring him to the emergency room. Yeah. The well-trained ER yeah. doctors, which they do yeah. at all the hospitals in our yeah. area, St. Joe's, DuPont, Parkview, Lutheran, yeah. evaluate these kids yeah. for their injuries. And if the doctor says they're okay, then probably that's the end of it. But if they're not okay then they're going yeah. to need more intensive care. Yeah. From sports injuries, the number of injuries to, uh, to the brain uh, are, are quite uh, common that, that I see. For example, uh, soccer injuries. You know, remember, we're talking about the three pounds piece of fat. You hit that uh, soccer ball with your head all the time or uh, start hitting heads uh, with, with another uh, soccer injury. They're starting to write medical papers uh, that uh, these people have uh, dementia, memory loss, their intelligence go down, their grades go down. And some, when the studies go way back, they've done in Europe, some end up with dementia, Alzheimer's disease. I mean, you, you keep on uh, hitting that head all the time. What do you think is going to happen to that brain? Right. And, uh, and multiple concussions especially need to be avoided. Multiple hits of the brain need to be avoided because these people go high on the dementia, Alzheimer's list, end up living in nursing homes in the 50s and uh, 60s, and sometimes even... Uh, uh, earlier. I have a question uh, about that. that for you. Mm -hmm. What about, you know, we've been reading a lot in the trauma literature about an entity called mild traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to explain that to parents sometimes after their child has yep. a concussion. Can you expound on like what a mild traumatic brain injury is obviously not something you operate on, but yeah. what kind of a professional would need to diagnose that? Well, you get a, you get a CT scan, and now you see some bruising in the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes from getting hit in the back of the head. They look bruised up, so it's more than, than a concussion. And down the line, if I get a scan, say, two months later, you're going to see some of the frontal lobe missing, some of the temporal lobe missing, and, and I'll tell you what else is going to be missing, some memory, some memory. Uh, and so that would be minimal cognitive impairment. So you're 30 and 40 years old and already you have your memory problems. Uh, and if you don't have good health habits, for example, uh, you're overweight, the inflammatory factors in fat can influence that and you probably could have Alzheimer's disease at age uh, 50. What about for kids? I've yeah. heard that sometimes yeah. their skill, school yep. performance can go down, they can drop a couple grades. Exactly. When they were college material to begin with, now they're not college material. 
And the parents yeah. would notice yeah. this then at home, yes. or the teachers would they, notice? They know that the cognitive impairment, the grades are going down, the behavior is uh, changing. Uh, and, uh, and memory loss is uh, occurring because the, the, the main uh, memory, uh, short-term memory, is the hippocampus in the temporal lobe. Well, the temporal lobe uh, at, at the bottom has a very rough skull, and the temporal lobe hits that skull uh, and gets injured very easily, very mm -hmm. easily. And if you scan them a year or two later, you can see that some part of these brains is, miss, is missing. Now, who would yeah. the parents, if they suspected such an injury, say their family doctor, mm -hmm. they took them, yeah. he doesn't see anything yeah. wrong, a CAT yeah. scan in the ear was okay, oh, they're okay, mm -hmm. but the parents are yeah. concerned. What kind of a professional, like a neurologic or a yeah, I think neuropsychologist should to, should, or someone? Yeah, should go to a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, uh, and th they can send them to a neuropsychological testing, gives them some tests to try to estimate if there indeed has been some organic, real uh, brain uh, uh, damage. And uh, this can uh, occur as more commonly uh, than we think. So the parent yeah. shouldn't necessarily, if the family doctor says, oh, I think everything's no, fine, no, just take it. No. The parent probably knows yeah. their child the best, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the reason I'm saying cautious. They'll say it needs to be cleared by a medical professional. But that medical professional has to be trained in the field. It has to be trained in the field. Now. It can't just be uh, uh, anybody. You know what I mean? Right. And not being critical, it's just the nature of it. Correct. I don't know anything about family practice, and, and they Either. may not know that much about uh, brain damage. Right. I'm sure right. some would, but I, I think that would be uh, uh, very uh, uh, important. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, Anything else you'd like to mention about trauma, chest injuries, heart injuries? Yeah, there's, uh, a, there's a couple things. We see a lot of rib fractures today, um, like one fellow I saw in the emergency room who slipped and fell and people break a rib or two ribs. Mm -hmm. There's some old wives' tales out there about wrapping the ribs, putting mm -hmm. ace mm -hmm. wraps around or plaster of Paris mm -hmm. on them or something. We don't do any of that anymore. None of that has been shown to make any kind of a difference, so we've completely abandoned it. Uh, Collarbones, people thought for if you fracture your collarbone, your clavicle, you have to wear a sling. That's yeah. not true. Most of the orthopedic surgeons I know nowadays have gotten away from that. Um, I think you need a diagnosis. You need to concentrate on respiratory therapy, particularly if you're a smoker, because you're at increased risk for things like pneumonia, which can take your life from a fairly minor trauma, which would be a rib fracture. Well, that's kind of interesting, uh, uh, Dr. Reed, because... You know, just like if you're anticoagulants, you increase your risk tremendously. And if you're a smoker and a minor injury to the chest, a few broken ribs can turn into a death sentence, can it really? Yeah, or yeah. end up in the respirator for a month, and we sure have seen it. We I've have. Se I've seen it uh, uh, with you. Minor concussion, broke three ribs, and then a respirator for uh, six weeks because of no pulmonary uh, reserve. Right. Uh, and so Time to put in a good plug for quitting smoking. Uh, so I, when you I, get your absolutely. rib fracture, you're not going to get pneumonia. Uh, yeah. I have a good DVD in my mind by the Institute <laughs> on smoking <laughs> sensation, incidentally. People are doing it less and less, but it's still about 20% of the people. Right. That you know another that thing that comes to yeah. mind about child injuries? I think we came across an article, or one of my assistants did, that while the the participation in youth sports, organized athletics among uh, school, you know, grade schoolers, middle schoolers, mm -hmm. high schoolers, has declined by 13 percent between the years of 1997 and 2007. The number of sports-related injuries has actually gone up. Now, I didn't see any speculation huh. about mm -hmm. are they playing harder, are they trying more to win. Frankly, I think that's preposterous because I'm sure they were yeah. when we were kids. They were trying to play to win. At least I was. I don't know about you. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't know if they're taking more dangerous activities or they're just checking them more carefully after, afterwards, but the number of injuries are actually an increase. And you see that talked about all the time in the NFL and in college football. You mentioned one thing about hockey being the most dangerous. Uh, the rate of injuries, I think, is, is the highest in hockey, the, the rate of serious injury. Football has more total injuries because more people play football. I and, uh, completely but, agree with that uh, But even assessment. other sports, like you were talking about baseball. Yeah. I saw uh, a fellow, I think it was from southern Michigan, Hillsdale, flown in by the helicopter down here. He, he was out uh, coaching his, his little leaguers or something, and he offered a pitch. He took a line drive in the temple, got an uh, uh, epidural hematoma, and you or one of your colleagues yeah, saved yeah. his life. Yeah, I, I remember that. And going back in history a little bit myself in my own life, I, had a, I was at summer camp at age 12 and a kid asked me if he could use my bat standing next to me. Not a very athletic child. He took the bat. It didn't mean to. 
knocked me out with the bat. <laughs> caused I, did, a depress, I did that. I caused did. a depressed skull fracture. I yeah, and, <laughs> and we didn't have CT scanning at the time. And maybe, I did that in grade school. Yeah, maybe that accounts know. for the way I am. I don't know. But, uh, but it was a major uh, injury. You know, we talk about trauma. Uh, we were talking about the head. And I meant to mention, too, the eye, the human eye. I've seen over the years uh, a significant number of eye injuries. I saw one recently. Matter of fact, I was talking about, uh, ran across a lawyer at an airport somewhere in Florida, and I said, well, what are you doing here? He says, oh, he says, I have a lawsuit going about a child, a uh, six-year-old, was going to a birthday party, and as he walked in, was hit by a paintball and blinded him permanently, permanently for life. Wow. So guess that's what's happening? Gonna, you know, first of all, the child can't cool. see, and you know the lawsuit's coming. Yeah, and I thought, and and I've uh, uh, seen it, of course, from golf ball injuries. I've seen uh, loss of vision. I've seen it from basketball, where a finger goes between, goes in the eye, and uh, blinds uh, somebody. Uh, I, I don't see. I mean, that that indeed uh, does occur. I got injury yeah. to both eyes, but it was from tennis. That's why yeah. I don't play it. Oh. Tennis is a dangerous sport. Yeah. What do you yeah, play it for? That's why yeah, I'm a big-time tennis player. That's why I got, wear glasses. Yeah, glass. the unbreakable uh, glasses. Very important because that's easy to do with the spin. Or goggles. You know I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and you know another yeah. source of injury we yeah. see uh, yeah. uh, at homes? Uh, yeah. I'll see guys who are... They get off work, they drive home safely, they're mm -hmm. not drinking, they mm -hmm. wear their seatbelt, they get out, they go in, they start mm -hmm. up the buzz saw in their garage, the circuit, yeah. Yeah. they throw a piece of wood in there with no eye protection yeah. in, and bang, the splinters or whatever hit them. And, and yeah. that is really important that they need to wear protective eyewear. Yeah, let's go through the house a little bit, uh, because we do see a number of uh, injuries that occur in, in people's homes. Right. Uh, uh, can be a fire. Incidentally, smoking uh, is the cause uh, of 40 percent of house fires. Wow. Isn't that interesting statistic? You should yeah. do a show on that someday. Yeah, I'm going to do a show because you inspired me to do it <laughs> because that, that's a huge uh, subject. Uh, we see a number of people that, that slip in the bathroom, for example. Right. Now, if they're on, on aspirin, coumadin, or any of those things, and they fall down and hit the back of their head, odds are they're going to end up in the emergency room. Probably 25% chance they're going to end up in intensive care. Right. So the bathroom, you need to look it over for anyone, for anyone. And, uh, and, and I'm always very careful in the bathroom to hold on to something and because you can slip like right. that, uh, uh, and especially the elderly, especially the elderly. Right. In the shower itself, should have a pad that's very rough right. that they can't fall in there. And, uh, and shower injuries, uh, bathroom injuries are extremely, are extremely you, uh, you uh, know common. You know that uh, Vicki Meyer, our injury, adult yeah. injury prevention coordinator, yeah. has a program she'll go to local retirement communities right? and, and uh, elder yeah. communities yeah. and give talks on injury prevention. Yeah. One of the most dangerous things as, as we age are rugs, throw rugs. Absolutely. And, and my yeah. own parents, I walk in their house, there are rugs all over the place, yeah. and people will trip yeah. on them, and they don't think about it. They get home from their, in their hip, yeah. new hip placed, and yeah. they've got their walker, they've got their cane, yeah. and they hit the rug, and down yeah. they go. Let's talk about stairs for a minute, stairs in homes. Uh, for anyone at any age, and I'll tell you a little story here. Uh, uh, I hate to refer to myself, but I, I tell you, I almost uh, 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 died and became quadriplegic from a stair. I was, vi I was visiting Europe, and I'm a friend of Andy Rude who plays the violin you see on PBS. He invited me to come to Mostek Holland, and I was in an internet cafe checking my stocks uh, between the concerts. Uh, and had sunglasses on in Europe. They don't have the safety things. They don't have st uh, railings on a lot of staircases, which are mandatory in the United States. Right. So with sunglasses on, I went to the staircase to go to the restroom, and 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 uh, and I slipped. I you, you know what saved me is I do the sun series in yoga at my yoga studio regularly. I've trained in that. I somersaulted down the stairs. My hands ended up two stairs below me, perfectly aligned, and my knees above perfectly aligned, and it happened like that. So it was reflex. Wow. It was reflex. Otherwise, uh, clearly, uh, I probably would have broke my neck or died or, 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 or whatever. So it can happen to anybody at a point. I always tell people, when we walk the stairs, take the railing, any age. I see people at Lutheran Hospital walking down the stairs with a cell phone in one hand and a bunch of charts in the other hand and just zipping down the stairs. Do they realize how dangerous, one little slip, you we, end up living in a nursing home how dangerous stairs are, and especially at home, especially uh, the elderly, or we have a cup of drinks and we're watching the ball game and we're not thinking. Uh, stairs can be very uh, dangerous, and using stairs outside the home. Personally, I think gutters should be cleaned out by professionals. I keep telling yeah. people all the time, my neighbor, a lawyer, when I used to live in Forest Park, didn't listen to me. Uh, he, he fell off the roof 
probably took him a year before he got over his broken femur. He was lucky to be alive. So cleaning out eaves, getting in the roof, that's professional's business. And they, they don't charge that much. I've seen many roof and ladder uh, injuries. You, you fall more than three or four feet, you can end up in a wheelchair for life. I've seen it uh, throughout all my years, commonly. Every, every, every year, yeah. I admit yeah. somebody who yeah. usually elderly, yeah. up on his roof, probably doing the yeah. same thing he'd done yeah. 20, 30 years, yeah. but then he trips yeah. and falls, falls yeah. off the ladder. We yeah. had a fellow this year. I saw a very seriously injured 12-year-old girl who yeah. was carrying a, a, a vacuum sweeper from yeah. the top floor to the bottom floor yeah. in her house. A dog raced past her, knocked her down the stairs, Dr. Cashman, and broke her back. Yeah. And Fortunately, she had no neurologic yeah. impairment. She healed. Yeah. But I told her parents and her, you are not to be carrying things like vacuum sweepers up and down, and, and certainly don't be going up and down with dogs running past yeah. you. It, it, and, uh, and a pet can be a cause of injury many times. Correct. I've seen they're going down the basement steps to get, get a, some pie they have baked there or something. Dog comes in behind them. They fall down. And before you know it, they get a broken back, uh, a severe head injury, and some of these are permanent. I've seen that many times. So, Correct. So stairs inside or outside the house are, are dangerous. Uh, cutting down trees, incidentally, I like to mention here, are horribly dangerous. The worst injuries I've ever seen is cutting down your own trees. Don't do it. You cannot predict. You cannot predict the way the tree is going to fall. We, and we, a, and a, and a, it, it, it may not go exactly opposite. That's for professionals. Cutting down trees is for professionals. It is not something you should do. We uh, saw a, yeah. a poor Amish a grandfather yeah. of a large family who yeah. his, his son and grandson were cutting down a tree. The yeah. tree dropped over yeah. and killed the grandfather. Oh, yeah. Now that yeah. life is ruined. The, the, everybody's going to yeah. feel guilty about that. I've and seen people just be annihilated by them. They think it's falling that way and goes, it comes out the other way and just takes a body in half. Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen it. They're the most horrible injuries, tree injuries. Mm -hmm. Stay away from trees. I agree. And uh, they make me nervous. I've seen I've yeah. seen people do incredibly stupid things. I had a fellow once who should have known better standing on the top of a pickup, reaching up with a chainsaw as yeah. high as he could to try to cut a yeah. branch off. And when the branch came down, he came down, the chainsaw came down, and I'll leave it to your imagination what happened. I've then. seen that more than once. Seen it more than one, more than once. Let's talk. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reed, for this very nice, serious discussion of trauma. And uh, we certainly have seen the reality of it. And, and we're trying to help prevent trauma. That's just what we're trying to do. Yeah, we're not we, telling people don't live their lives. No, no, no. And have we're fun trying to and... uh, prevent things. And uh, and if it does happen, uh, I think we have the real expertise team. We're trying together. to put ourselves out of business, right? Exactly. So, this is what we're doing. And so I then we can do television full time. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> your sincerity and sense of uh, humor. I'd like to talk to you a little bit for a minute here in our remaining time about something that, that uh, I know I'm very passionate about, and you're the only guy I know uh, that is as passionate about as I am, and in total agreement with, uh, with my way of thinking. Uh, I'd like to talk about pain a little bit. We have in this, and that can result in, uh, in certainly in, uh, in trauma. I think there's something wrong. Uh, with our understanding uh, of pain I I among the people and the, and the, the medical community uh, throughout the nation, I I throughout the nation. And I have a, shortly have a book coming out uh, on it, and I've already written a book on it, Nocebo, The Evil Twin, on it, which is an entrance to the pain problem. What we see a lot of, and, and, and I know Dr. Reed agrees with me, people with acute pain is a broken leg. Uh, you, uh, uh, the Buddhists would call it arrow one pain. Uh, you treat it with a narcotic, you put a cast on there, and in a month the problem is over and the medicine should be gone. What we have been seeing, people who've had trauma and have had injuries, people continue with the narcotic medication and turn these people who've had some trauma with acute pain, turn them into drug addicts. Absolutely. We, we see, see this it commonly. all the time. We see this commonly. There has to be an end point. Medicine must have an end point with an occasional exception where, you know, there's some permanent uh, deformity and they may need it for a long period of time. But the majority of patients don't need long-term use of narcotics. There's a couple, there's a couple of downsides to it. Yeah. One is with the narcotics, yeah. it'll eventually quit working and you have to take more and more of it. Second, you become yeah. dependent on it. And, and, and whether and, it's legal or not, you're yeah. an addict. Yeah, and then you turn uh, into what I call chronic pain, pain more than six months, uh, where uh, the pain really is anxiety, fear, uh, stress, uh, and you've had sensitization of your brain by the narcotic. Pain research has actually shown narcotics only help 
30% of the people, 30% of the time. So why would you give a narcotic to someone for chronic pain when you don't even know why they got the pain? But yet, you and I have noticed in this community, we have thousands of patients who are addicted to narcotics. Unfortunately, based on prescriptions, prescriptions, we've seen 70 deaths in our counties last year from prescription narcotics for reasons you and I don't understand. This needs to stop. Don't accept a narcotic unless you have cancer, a broken bone, or something serious. Uh, please don't accept a prescription. Again, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reed. It was a wonderful discussion, and, and I can't help but praise Dr. Reed for this wonderful work that he's doing. Uh, and I really enjoy working with you, and I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and attend some of the other lectures that we give at the Cashman Auditorium at the Lufen Hospital, because really, uh, as you can tell, uh, wellness uh, is my passion, and it's Dr. Reed's passion. We li like you uh, to be well. And a very thank you very much uh, for uh, watching uh, this show. We'll make a DVD out of it. It'll be available uh, at Lufen Hospital if you uh, like to watch it again. And, uh, and, uh, It'll be on uh, Monday night, 9 to 10 next Monday on Public Access TV. You can watch the whole thing again. We'll play it throughout the year. And, uh, and uh, thanks so much uh, uh, for listening.